This is Lester Hightower on the afternoon of July 13th. This is a practice run through of the speech I intend to give next week at the Children with Diabetes Friends for Life Conference in Orlando. The talk is entitled Success with Dr. Richard K. Bernstein's Very Low Carb Regimen, ages 5 to 14. Managing type 1 diabetes is hard work, but great success is possible and I believe that it's worth the effort. This presentation shares information about my family's nine year journey with type 1 diabetes. But I'm not a medical professional and this presentation is not intended to give personal medical advice. I want to thank Jeff and the Children with Diabetes organization for the invitation to speak today. I feel privileged to have been asked and I pray that this talk is encouraging and inspiring and that it benefits you. I have a lot of material to cover and so I must present quickly. I will skim and possibly skip some slide content, but you may download and review these slides later and note that most slides include links to reference material. So today I'll start by introducing myself, my family, and Dr. Richard K. Bernstein. Then I'll summarize my son's nine years of outcomes with type 1 diabetes, the disease state and its prevailing outcomes, and Dr. Bernstein's regimen and how my family applies it day to day. Then I'll discuss why we choose to manage diabetes this way. I'll demonstrate that we are not alone. I'll share some recent research done on the regimen, provide some meal details and food related tips and tricks, and then introduce you to the nonprofit Revere Foundation. So professionally, I'm an information technology leader and a software engineer. I hold a bachelor's degree in economics from Florida State University, and my career is mainly focused on technology related to freight transportation. I've been married for 22 years and I'm the father of two children. I'm a student and proponent of low carb eating and Dr. Bernstein's diabetes management regimen. And I'm a founding board member of the nonprofit Revere Foundation. This is a picture of my immediate family taken in November of last year. Standing behind me is my son, Andrew. He's now 14 years old. In front of me is my wife, Ellen, and in front of her is my daughter, Gracie, who is now 10 years old. My type 1 diabetes connection is Andrew. He was diagnosed in June of 2010, a few weeks after his fifth birthday. The picture to the left is him in the hospital on his diagnosis day. The picture to the right was taken last November uh, when he was 13 years old. These 14 photographs were taken about one year apart, starting at birth uh, through November of last year. The top five photographs, which are from birth to four years old, are prior to my son's diabetes diagnosis. The bottom nine photographs were all taken after Andrew's diabetes diagnosis, and they can give you a good sense of the stages of life that we've walked uh, with Andrew through with type 1 diabetes. In the top left of this slide, you see pictures of Andrew participating in my favorite pastime, fishing. In the top right is Andrew playing his favorite sport, which is basketball. And across the bottom, you see things like soccer, flag football, and karate. The picture to the left here is of Ellen and Andrew taking the morning of Andrew's first day of kindergarten. Uh, that was about two months after he was diagnosed with diabetes. The picture to the right I snapped a couple of weeks ago uh, on a Sunday afternoon after we returned home from church. Before I leave this slide, I'd like to acknowledge that Ellen and Andrew bear the brunt of the day-to-day -day burden of type 1 diabetes management and that they deserve most of the credit for the success that I will share with you today. So an alternative title for this talk could easily have been the best $20 I've ever spent. In the center of this slide, you see an Amazon.com order that I placed on June 26th of 2010. That was nine days after Andrew's diagnosis. You can see I paid $19.79 for the third edition of Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution. To the right is a picture of the fourth edition and the current edition of the book, which was published in 2011. Dr. Bernstein was born in New York City in 1934. He developed type 1 diabetes in 1946 at the age of 12. By his 30s, he was suffering from many diabetes complications. In 1969, he obtained an Ames reflectance meter that gave a blood sugar reading in one minute. It weighed three pounds, cost him $650, was only available to certified physicians and hospitals. His wife was a doctor and she ordered the instrument for him. He was age 35 then. 
Within a year, he had refined his insulin and diet to the point that he had relatively normal blood sugars throughout the day. And after years of chronic fatigue and complications, he felt healthy and energized. He wrote a paper describing his technique and tried to get it published, but no medical journals would accept it in part because he was not a medical doctor. In 1977, he decided to give up his job to become a physician. At age 45, he entered the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and in 1983, he opened his own medical practice near his home in New York. His first book on low-carb diabetes manage management was published in 1981, and the first edition of Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution was published in 1997. Today, at 85 years old, he continues to practice medicine in his New York clinic, to make Diabetes University on YouTube videos, and to conduct free monthly telecasts that describes his regimen and answers uh, questions. This is an infographic that Dr. Bernstein put on Facebook uh, in 2016. Back then, he was 82 years old. He had been type 1 diabetic since the age of 12. He says he still practices medicine, working 40 hours a week or more on his feet. He performs high-intensity interval, interval training, and he believes that diabetics have the right to normal blood sugars and that you can do it too. Now at age 85, Dr. Bernstein has been achieving nearly normal blood sugars for 50 years. The motivational speaker Tony Robbins says if you want to be successful, find a person who has achieved the results you want, copy what they do, and you'll achieve the same results. Dr. Bernstein says every person with diabetes is entitled to the same blood sugars as a person without diabetes and that he's eaten a low-carb diet and had healthy, non-diabetic blood sugars for many decades, and that you can too. In July of 2010, my wife and I chose to follow Dr. Bernstein, and Diabetes Solution quickly became the best $20 that I've ever spent. And this infographic of our journey shows why. So Andrew was diagnosed in June of 2010 at five years old with an A1C of 10.6. Very soon after diagnosis, we moved Andrew to Dr. Bernstein's regiment. And what you see in that graph is over nine years of A1Cs, right around 5%. For what I just shared with you, my deepest and most heartfelt emotion is gratitude. I feel blessed beyond all measure that this story is my family story. And I'm excited to share more information with you about our nine-year journey. To properly tell that story, I first need to summarize the type 1 diabetes disease state and the prevailing outcome. So, Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease that destroys the body's ability to make insulin, which is a vital hormone for blood sugar control. Severely elevated blood sugar is the hallmark of the disease, and synthetic insulin to lower blood sugar is imperative to sustain life. Healthy bodies tightly regulate blood sugar within a narrow range, but healthy bodies can rapidly place insulin directly into the portal vein. Subcutaneously injected or infused insulin is a poor substitute for that. Poor blood sugar control leads to dire health consequences, therefore excellent control is highly desirable. But insulin is a powerful drug and the body blindly responds to its commands and that creates a lot of challenges. Hemoglobin A1C is a common blood test used to diagnose and engage how well diabetes is managed. The A1C test re reflects uh, average blood sugar for the past two to three months and higher A1C levels are indicative of worse blood sugar control and therefore an increased risk of developing diabetes complications. Non-diabetic A1C levels are about 5%. This chart is taken from a diabetes care article published in May of 2009. I highlighted with a red line the peak of the cohort of the folks in this study that had normal fasting blood glucose and you can see at the bottom there, uh, that A1C is just a smidge over 5%. So I copy-pasted this information from the American Diabetes Association website about why A1C matters. High glucose levels cause complications in people with diabetes. Keeping glucose levels as low as possible 
prevents or slows down some complications. For the diabetes control and complications trial, half continued standard treatment while the other half followed an intensive control program. Findings for intensive control compared with standard treatment were that diabetic eye disease started in only one quarter as many people. Kidney disease started in only half as many people. Nerve disease started in only one third as many people. And far fewer people with early forms of these complications got worse. The information on this slide is taken from an article published in February of this year in Diabetes Technology and Therapeutics entitled State of Type 1 Diabetes Management and Outcomes. A few results that I'd like to highlight is that average A1C across all age groups in the most recently studied time period was 7.8%. About half of the studied patients were overweight or obese. The study is interesting for a couple of reasons. It had a very large number of participants, almost 23,000. Those patients were studied over two time periods, six years apart. The earliest time period was 2010 to 2012. It's represented by the orange line in the graph there to the bottom right. The newest time period was 2016 to 2018, represented by the blue line. What's so troublesome to me about these results is that prevailing outcomes measured by A1C have gotten markedly worse between these two time periods and dramatically worse among children, adolescents, teenagers, and young adults. And technology is not prov improving prevailing outcomes. All three of these charts are from that same paper. I just shared with you the chart to the left. And at the same time uh, these A1C results are going up, CGM usage has increased very dramatically as represented in the top right. And insulin pump usage has also continued to go up. So let's take a second and compare my son's glycemic control versus those prevailing outcomes I just showed you. To help us visualize that, I dropped two vertical red lines in at five years of age and 14 years of age. If you look at Andrew's A1Cs starting five months after his type 1 diabetes diagnosis, that's November of 2010, through February of this year, he's had 30 A1C tests and they averaged a 4.96%. And you can see that his A1C results have been pretty much flat for that entire nine years. Now compare it with his peer group on the right. At age five, Andrew's peers were averaging an A1C just over 8%. It looks like 8.1% to me. Now at age 14, his peer group is well into the 9% range. It looks to me like 9.2% is probably where the 14 year olds are uh, averaging today. So this chart is created based on a couple of math formulas that came out of the diabetes uh, complications and control trial. Um, the uh, chart uh, is designed to demonstrate the relationship between A1C and average blood sugar. I've added to the chart the prevailing outcomes that I shared with you on the previous few slides. And now I've added to the chart the outcomes of the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial. The standard control group achieved an A1C average of 9% and the intensive control group achieved an A1C average of 7%. And now I've added my son's nine years of outcomes. His lowest A1C in the last nine years was 4.6%. His highest was 5.4%. Most of them were between 4.8 and 5.2. As I shared with you, his nine-year average was 4.96%. So the takeaways that I'd like you to see here is that prevailing outcomes are not good. Recent studies show that those outcomes are actually getting worse, but vastly better outcomes are possible. So now I'd like to share with you a summary of Dr. Bernstein's diabetes management regimen and describe to you how my family applies it day to day. So this slide has my best attempt at boiling Dr. Bernstein's regiment down to one slide. That was not an easy task, but uh, I, I did my best. Uh, let's start with the laws of small numbers. That is the title to chapter seven of Dr. Bernstein's book. Uh, chapter seven opens with this sentence. Big inputs make big mistakes. Small inputs make small mistakes. Small inputs 
and small mistakes are the cornerstone of Dr. Bernstein's regimen. With specific regard to blood sugars, we pursue long and shallow hills and we work very hard to avoid short and steep peaks. There's a CGM uh, graph on this slide uh, of a diabetic that follows Dr. Bernstein's regimen. There's actually two charts on that graph. The top one is the past three hours of that diabetic's blood sugar and the bottom charge is the past 48 hours or two days. The lower end of the chart, both charts, is 65 milligrams per deciliter and the upper range is 120 milligrams per deciliter and you can see that this diabetic is achieving the long and shallow hills and successfully avoiding short and steep peaks. The three major tenets that I think about that allow us to do that are shown to the right. A low carb, high protein diet, learning to properly use insulins, and learning to precisely correct low blood sugars. In the next mini slides, I'm gonna walk through each one of those tenets one at a time. Starting with the low carb, high protein diet, where carbohydrate has a limit, Protein has a goal, and fat comes along for the ride. But I've decided to start this section of the talk by addressing the elephant in the room head on. And that is that carbohydrate is not an essential macronutrient. Dr. Richard Lunkwith says it this way, we have essential amino acids, we have to eat protein or we're gonna die. We have fatty acids that are essential, we have to eat fats or we're gonna die. But there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. Now, if the information on this slide surprises you, then the information on this slide will probably surprise you even more. Because the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies, in their 1,332-page Dietary Reference Intake ma Manual, in Chapter 6 that covers dietary carbohydrates, states... The lower limit of dietary carbohydrate compatible with life apparently is zero, provided that adequate amounts of protein and fat are consumed. So diets simply do not need carbohydrates. But it is true that cells need glucose. But it's also true that several human metabolic processes make glucose. Two of those are gluconeogenesis, which makes glucose from non-carbohydrate substrates, including amino acids from protein foods. Another is glycogenolysis, which makes glucose from glycogen. And before I make the tiny little elephant completely disappear, I'd like to talk for just a moment about how much glucose is normally in a person's entire body. So the average adult has between four and a half and five and a half liters of blood. At an 83 milligram per deciliter glucose concentration, the math is actually very easy. In five liters or 50 deciliters of blood, that's 4.2 grams or one teaspoon. So as I stand here speaking to you this afternoon, my entire bloodstream has approximately one teaspoon of glucose in it. On the internet, it's very easy to find photographs like the one on the top left there that correlate teaspoons of sugar to sugar and fructose sweetened soft drinks. I think people think less about the photograph right below there which relates one half of one medium banana which is represented by the slices in that small glass serving dish to the four and a half teaspoons of sugar that's actually in one half of that banana. I don't have time to go through the table to the right but it uh, inventories some common food items and compares the amount of sugar in those food items to the amount of sugar in an entire human body. Um, I, I don't have time to go through it, but I'll mention that my son does not eat any of the food above the red line, and he routinely consumes foods below the red line. So this food pyramid is representative of how our low-carb, high-protein diet is constructed. You can see that our diet is anchored in meat, eggs, and dairy. We add to that some green vegetables, a smaller portion of non-green vegetables, an even smaller portion of nuts and seeds, and a very small portion of some low glycemic berries, such as raspberries, blueberries, and strawberries. Our goal is to provide excellent nutrition while avoiding rapid increases in blood sugar. To do that, we completely exclude 
foods like bread, pasta, sugar, milk, corn, beans, rice, etc. Regarding fat, we do not fear fat, but we also do not push fat, nor do we chase ketosis in my son. Really for us, fat is just along for the ride, and it typically comes along with our protein foods. So in practice, this is a look at daily carbohydrate and protein intake in my son. Uh, I averaged two random days in November, and you can see that Andrew ate 30 grams of carbohydrate and 258 grams of protein by averaging those two days. That's on a daily basis. He accomplished that macronutrient distribution by eating plates of food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner that look very similar to those that I photographed and put on this slide. So it's important to know that growing kids need a lot of protein. Uh, growing kids have a lot of bodybuilding to do. Uh, this slide is pretty representative of how rapid boys grow. Uh, the photograph to the left was taken in November of 15 when Andrew was 10 years old. The photograph in the middle is one year later, and you can see he's grew tremendously. He went from below my collarbone up to above my shoulder. Photograph to the right was two years later, taken in November of last year at age 13, and you can see how much he grew. To try to give you some quantitative idea of how rapidly Andrew is growing at this time, uh, we recently changed endocrinologists, and as a result, we had visits 65 days apart. In those 65 days, Andrew grew two centimeters, which is eight-tenths of an inch. So we let Andrew's hunger guide his protein consumption. Andrew knows he can always ask us to adjust his protein portions up or down, and he does that as he desires. In recent months, as an example, he's moved his evening meat portion from as low as 8 ounces to as high as 11 ounces, and he does that in accordance with his activity and hunger. Uh, Dr. Bernstein has daily recommendations. He recommends a minimum of 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight for sedentary adults and 2 to 5 times that amount for active, growing children. So next I'm going to talk about properly using insulins, and this is using the correct insulins and learning to properly dose and time them. But to have that conversation, we have to talk about food just a little bit more. Uh, the graph to the right shows the relative blood glucose impact of carbohydrate, protein, and fat. You'll notice carbohydrate drawn in red has the most severe and rapid impact on relative blood glucose in the body. Protein certainly has an impact on blood glucose, but you can see that it's much less dramatic than carbohydrate and it's stretched out over a much longer period of time. And recall that in our diet, carbohydrate has a limit, a low limit, protein has a goal, and fat is just along for the ride. So on the dietary side, you can see how we strive for and achieve long, shallow hills and avoid short and steep peaks. The graph to the right shows activity profiles of different types of insulin. I've highlighted in red the three commonly prescribed ultra-rapid acting insulins, name brands of which you'll recognize as Humalog, Novolog, and Apedra. You can see the very rapid, very intense action profiles of those insulins. They are designed to try to chase the rapid blood sugar rise of carbohydrate foods. Just to the right, drawn in solid purple, is the activity profile of regular human insulin. Eli Lilly sells it under the brand name Humulin R. Nova Nordisk sells it as Novalin R. And as the name implies, it is regular human insulin that's not been modified by science to act more quickly or more slowly. And if you look at the activity profile of regular insulin, you probably can see that that activity profile matches our low carbohydrate, high protein diet much faster, or excuse me, much better than the more rapidly acting insulins. And we cover most of Andrew's meals with Novalin R, a regular insulin. Dr. Bernstein has released this infographic on Facebook in which he describes the same thing that I did on the previous slide, but in a little different way. Uh, the graph to the right shows the activity profile of a low-carb meal as it would try to raise blood sugar, and it also shows the activity pro profile down below of regular insulin as it would offset that slow, prolonged rise in blood sugar from a low-carb, high-protein meal, and the resultant red line is a relatively flat blood glucose level. 
To the right, you see a common mistake that people can make if they change their diet to a low carb meal plan, but continue to try to use ultra rapid acting insulins. What happens is in the first couple of hours after the start of the meal, you can get hypoglycemia. In fact, you could have quite severe hypoglycemia because you have way too much insulin action in that time period. You may have to actually treat that hypoglycemia with glucose to get back up to a safe blood sugar level. And then as time passes and that insulin action wears off, but the low carb high protein meal continues to have an effect on blood sugar, you'll experience hyperglycemia. So early hypoglycemia and later hyperglycemia is a common mistake folks can make if they try to change their meal plan without changing their insulins. And lastly, we're going to talk about precisely correcting low blood sugar using measured doses of glucose and being careful not to overcorrect. So glucose doesn't need to be digested or converted by the liver into anything else, which is why we like using pure glucose. And we use measured amounts of pure glucose to raise blood sugar rapidly and precisely. Pictured to the bottom left are two types of glucose that we routinely use with Andrew. Smarties is a candy that's uh, made of pure dextrose with just some food coloring. So it's basically pure glucose. It's also made in three different sizes, which are convenient. The original Smartie, which is the smallest candy, is four tenths of a gram of glucose per little piece of candy. And when Andrew was much younger and much smaller, that was the appropriate size for him to use. As he grew, he graduated into the giant Smartie, which is one gram of glucose per piece of candy. And now at 14 years old and nearly six feet tall, the Mega Smartie at three grams per piece of candy is most appropriate for Andrew. Overnight, and sometimes during sporting activities, we prefer to correct Andrew's blood sugar with liquid glucose. I have photographed here a, a common brand. Uh, these types of small bottles of liquid glucose are available in all pharmacies. Uh, and the concentrations are, are typically the same, and they are 1.25 grams of pure glucose per teaspoon. And we dose liquid glucose in Andrew by the teaspoon. The table to the right comes from chapter 20 of Dr. Bernstein's book, and it gives you a nice starting point to understand how much one gram of glucose will raise blood sugar. It is just a starting point because individual results will vary. As an example, I circled in red where Andrew currently falls on this chart, and the table here would indicate that one gram of glucose should raise Andrew's blood sugar about four and a half points, when in reality, a gram of glucose raises Andrew about seven to seven and a half milligrams per deciliter. So now I'm going to talk about my family's day-to-day -day application of Dr. Bernstein's management regimen. And I'm going to start by sharing with you our day-to-day -day diabetes management tools. Starting in the top right, you can see photographed there are two books. There's a large three-ring binder. And on top of that three-ring binder is a much smaller orange log book. Andrew carries the orange log book with him. Uh, everywhere he goes day to day and he uses the information in that book to help him uh, help inform his insulin dosing decisions. The large three ring binder stays on a kitchen counter in my home and the pages in that binder look like the one on the, the right of this slide, the diabetes management diary pages. And you can see that we record in those pages the foods that Andrew eats, the blood sugar results that we get before and after each meal and the couple of tests that we make during the night. Uh, we also record insulin doses, but I've smudged those out uh, in this slide because I don't want to be giving personal medical advice. Uh, we also record uh, other things like uh, physical activity. You can see, for example, on this day he had basketball practice from 3 to 6 p.m. I also can see that during basketball practice he took two sweet tarts during his practice. So that's two grams of carbohydrate in that three hours. So his blood sugar got a little bit low and you can see he took a very small amount of glucose to raise that blood sugar. The next thing in our toolkit is Andrew's blood sugar meter. You can see it uh, photographed on the top center of the slide. Next are the three Novo Nordisk insulins that we use every day. And then you can see photographs there, um, standard insulin syringes and the two forms of glucose that I described on an earlier slide. 
It really goes without saying, but I'll note that advanced technology does not underlie our diabetes management success. So we employ a continuous improvement mindset. My advice to you is to record everything, especially in the beginning. I showed you on the last slide the kinds of things that we record, and we reflect on that data, and we combine it with an understanding of the action times of insulin to beneficially adjust our regimen. Beneficial adjustments can take many forms, but they most often involve raising or lowering insulin doses or moving their times forward or backward. Getting off the blood sugar roller coaster is really important because it allows a person to observe details. They just can't be seen when blood sugars are in constant flux. And being able to observe and react to those details allows one to hone their personal management regimen. I'd like to, to take a minute to clarify that, that I am not anti-technology. In fact, I think diabetes technology is great, but I know that technology alone cannot provide near to normal blood sugars. And even if technology someday achieves that feat, cost will keep it out of reach for most of the world's insulin dependent population. And that actually matters to me. My son's proof that technologies like CGMs and insulin pumps are not required to achieve great success. He's never used either. Despite Andrew not using a CGM, I actually very much recommend their use. And so does Dr. Bernstein. In fact, he insists on CGM use for all of his pediatric patients and for adults who live alone. I know many successful insulin pumpers, but Dr. Bernstein cautions against their use primarily due to scar tissue that can occur at effusion sites and degrade insulin absorption. And lastly, I feel very strongly that people deserve medical liberty. I fear a future where only ultra-rapid acting insulins are available, and they're intended for use only in infusion pumps. So my family's in it together. We all eat the same low-carbon, high-protein diet, and we have for nine years. It is absolutely true that at the start, we did that for my young son's sake. But we all benefited. Ellen and I both lost weight, and we regained health that we had lost. In our mid-40s, Ellen and I both weigh what we did in college. In the photograph there to the left, taken December of 2009, you can see that I'm fairly heavy. That photograph was taken six months before Andrew was diagnosed with diabetes. The photograph in the middle, a year later, almost exactly six months after Andrew's diabetes diagnosis, and I had lost 40 pounds. The picture to the right, taken in November of last year, now nine years later, than the photograph to the left, and that 40 pounds remains off of me. This is a lifestyle for us. It's a healthy way of eating. I don't think of it as a diet. Dr. Bernstein says if you're trying to convince a low-carb, excuse me, a type 1 diabetic child to eat low-carb, that it's really important to get the entire family on board, and I think he's right about that. Now I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about why we choose to manage type 1 diabetes this way. There's three things I want to talk about. Safety, quality of life, and the fact that there is no deprivation. In terms of short-term safety, high-carb foods require large doses of highly potent ultra-rapid insulins. And it is impossible to dependably match those foods and ultra-rapid insulins. Instead, Andrew has slower lows and lower highs, which are much safer. In terms of long-term safety, Dr. Bernstein's dehydrating illness protocol leads to dramatically fewer diabetes-related hospitalizations. Typical rates are high, and in the nine years Andrew's had type 1 diabetes, he's never been to a hospital for anything diabetes-related, not even during times of illness. The commonly occurring long-term complications of diabetes come from chronic, abnormally high blood sugar levels, and we completely avoid those. In terms of quality of life, we have far less fear of diabetes due to the enhanced safety that I shared with you on the last slide. Having slower lows and lower highs means that diabetes commands less constant attention from us. Becoming the captain of your own ship 
through the mastery of diabetes management is hugely rewarding. And lastly, there just is no deprivation. While it's true that most of the food that my family eats are from the outer perimeters of grocery stores, we eat phenomenally well. The two pictures to the bottom right were taken on Andrew's 14th birthday. The plate of food there is a really nice hamburger uh, made on a very low carb smart bun. To the right of that hamburger is coleslaw and to the rear of the plate are zucchini fries, a substitute for potato french fries. And to the right is the newly minted 14 year old giving a thumbs up as he eats that meal. By the way, hamburgers are Andrew's favorite food in the world, which is why he was served this meal uh, on his birthday. Um, and uh, we eat hamburgers this way on smart buns fairly often. In my family, we gladly trade highly processed convenient foods for enhanced safety and quality of life. So here's a real example of why I like to manage type 1 diabetes this way. This example happened to occur on May 1st during a 2 p.m. conference call that I had with Jeff where we were discussing me speaking here today. As I just told you, Andrew loves grilled hamburgers, but at his school cookout, by the time he made it to the food line, only hot dogs remained. Fillers in those hot dogs, most likely cornstarch, raised his blood sugar. And he texted me when he took his postprandial blood sugar a couple hours later, and he said, so at the cookout, the people ran out of food, right? So they end up only having hot dogs for people so I had to eat those. My blood sugar was just 180 and I gave myself two units. Do you think that was fine? Regarding that Novolog dose? Yeah, was my simple reply. Andrew replied, okay. And then I replied, really sorry that they didn't have hamburgers, bub. Now what I like about this interaction with my son is that most of my reply was about sympathy that he missed out on hamburgers that I know that he loves so much. It really wasn't about the high blood sugar correction. And just to finish telling the story, I went back and looked in our log books when I built this slide. Two and a half hour la hours later, when he next tested his blood sugar, it was 92 milligrams per deciliter. So from time to time, I, I get asked, you know, what if Andrew grows up and hates you? What if he rebels? Reasonable questions, I guess, but these are my responses. The Diabetes Control and Complications trial showed benefit of tight glucose control even decades after the study ended. If Andrew rebels, he wasn't harmed on our watch. And he'll leave our care knowing the consequences of poor glucose control and how to avoid them. Really, I just view this as parenting with higher stakes, at least where Andrew's physical well-being is concerned. And I also have faith in Proverbs 22.6. I also believe that the best parenting is honest and that it leads by example. And we are also not alone. This slide describes an age eight boy in St. Louis, Missouri, who was diagnosed in 2011 at one years old. His mom provided to me this journey chart from diagnosis up through start beginning to follow Dr. Bernstein's diabetes solution. For the last four years, as you can see on the right half of that chart, uh, this young boy, who's now eight, has had A1C values between 4.5 and 5.0%. This slide shows an age 10 boy in Melbourne, Australia. He's had diabetes for five years. He's followed Dr. Bernstein now for four years. You can see the change in that graph from standard care to following Dr. Bernstein's regimen, and he's now got over four years of A1Cs right around 5%. I wish I had time to go through the table at the bottom that his father also sent me that talks about some quality of life issues, but I'm sorry, I just don't. If you'd like to look at it later, this is slide 63. Uh, this is Miss Emily. She's 10 years old and she lives in Jacksonville, Florida. I know Emily and her family very well because they happen to attend my church. Uh, Emily was diagnosed at the age of five in uh, September of 2014 with an A1C of 13.3. Uh, they moved to the Bernstein's Regiment in January of 15, so about, uh, what would it be, four or five months later. And Emily's now 10 years old with over four years of A1Cs, as you can see right there at 5%. This is Gordon a recent college, college graduate. He was diagnosed as a senior in high school at age 17. He began Dr. Bernstein's regimen in May of 2015, uh, and he now has over four years of A1Cs right around that 5% mark, and he's 22 years old and recently graduated from Princeton. I'm really impressed with this young man to be diagnosed as a senior in high school and to achieve those remarkable 
diabetes management results while in college, and not just any college. This young man went to Princeton. This slide has links to just many, many, many hours of YouTube and Facebook videos of people giving testimonies much like mine today. Um, this is slide uh, 66 if you'd like to grab the deck and, uh, and watch some of these videos later. Type 1 Grid is a community of committed Bernstein followers uh, gathered via a private Facebook group. It was founded in April of 2014. I discovered the group in November of 2015 and it had just over a thousand members then. Today, it has over 3,200 members. Then they're split about evenly between parents of children and adults with type 1 diabetes. The group is an excellent example of what is possible. This slide uh, shares some sort of before and after um, uh, information that, w that was impactful to my family around finding type 1 diabetes. I put it in the backdrop of Andrew's A1Cs to make the point that those didn't really change much. So for my family, finding type 1 grit had other benefits. So prior to type 1 grit, we knew of no one else in the entire world following Dr. Bernstein's regimen. All of the type 1 diabetic children that Andrew had ever met ate more freely and were comparatively poorly managed. All new food and recipe experiments just happened on an N equals one scale inside of my family, and food discoveries really were limited to our own efforts or happenstance. Care decisions had only my wife and me for brainstorming. Uh, we certainly didn't have any help from the medical community in implementing Dr. Bernstein's plan. After finding type one grit, I now routinely interact with hundreds of Bernstein followers. Andrew now knows many well-managed type 1 diabetic children, adolescents, teenagers, and I know several multi-decade Bernstein followers. Public service announcements, recipes, tips and tricks, they just flow through the group and they are a huge blessing. And the Revere Foundation exists. I've also had the privilege of attending quite a number of grit togethers. In fact, I've attended them as in three different states, Florida, Georgia, and Texas. I took photographs of food at two of those grit togethers. The three pictures across the top were at my home in Florida. The two on the bottom were at a friend's home in Georgia. The young man to the right is the type one diabetic son of those friends from Georgia. And you see him pictured behind a plate of low carbohydrate desserts that he's getting ready to enjoy. And I know that those desserts were very easy on his blood sugars. I'd now like to introduce you to a few senior citizen type 1 gritters. This is Mr. Jamie Sharples. He's 66 years old and lives in Chinook, Montana. He found Dr. Bernstein's first book in 1981 and has followed the regiment for 38 years so far. In April, Jamie posted a one-sentence post to type 1 grit that I really liked. He said, I've spent 47 years now hearing about the cure. But I thank God for my 38 years of living in the solution. I also put on the slide a comment that Jamie made to someone else's post in which he described finding Dr. Bernstein's first book in 1981. He actually put a photograph of his copy of the book, uh, and you can see it there on the slide. Uh, Dr. Bernstein was still in college at this point. Uh, Jamie was able to track him down, but Dr. Bernstein insisted that Jamie find a local doctor to work with, and Jamie had a hard time doing that. Uh, he actually found a local heart surgeon in Chinook, Montana, uh, who was also a type 1 diabetic and had already found Dr. Bernstein and was following his outlandish way of controlling blood sugars. And Jamie and that heart surgeon worked together for many years uh, following Dr. Bernstein's regimen. This is a post doctor that uh, Jamie made when he introduced himself to the group when he first joined in September of 2016. At that time, he was 63 years old. He talked about being diagnosed in 1973 and that for the first eight years, he thought he was going to die. He actually provided several paragraphs that I redacted here describing how he found Dr. Bernstein and contacted Dr. Bernstein, found the heart surgeon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he closed by saying that he has nine children but that one of his daughters was recently diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. The two photos here are of Jamie, his wife, and their nine children. The other photo is of, of Jamie and his daughter, Promise, who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes about three years ago now. This is Miss Amy Fields' parent. She turns 65 years old next week, and she lives in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. She was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 1971 at age 16. 
She sent me this bulleted list, and I'm going to try to just read it to you. These are her words. By 42 years old, I was sick and desperate. I had frozen shoulders, frozen hips, stiff person syndrome, fatigue, and depression. A diabetic friend sent a Dr. Bernstein article about frozen shoulder and high blood sugars. At the end was an offer for two cassette tapes that explained his method. They arrived on June 2nd of 1996. My husband and I listened to the tapes, and the next day I switched to five shots a day from one and to a very low-carbohydrate diet. Right away, my depression and fatigue lifted. Over the next few months, all other complications lifted. I am happy and healthy. My husband and I exercise. We walk six to seven miles a day. We have three grown children and five grandchildren. I am eternally grateful to Dr. Bernstein for saving my life. This is Ms. Juanita Hansen. She is 66 years old and lives in Lincoln, Nebraska. These are also her words. I'm going to try to just read them to you. I have had type 1 diabetes for 45 years, since age 21. About six years ago at age 60, and after being quite sick for many years, I began a journey to restore my health. My motivation was marrying my husband, Ron. I suffered from poorly controlled type 1 diabetes, painful neuropathy, gastroparesis, depression, and anxiety. On my own, I lowered my A1C from 9 to 6. But to achieve that, I wasn't able to eat much. On social media, I heard of A1C values in the fives for the first time and the suggestion to read Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution. I read Dr. Bernstein's book and I follow his protocol to the best of my ability. I also changed from an insulin pump to multiple daily injections of insulin. My A1C has been between 4.9 and 5.5% for the past two and a half years. I no longer have symptoms of gastroparesis, neuropathy, depression, or anxiety, and I take far fewer medications. My type 1 diabetic brother, Dale, was only 27 years old when he died. He was blind with gastroparesis and kidney failure. I was diagnosed that same year. I want to help others in memory of Dale. So now I want to share some recent research that was done on Dr. Bernstein's management regimen. Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School studied a, a group of patients out of the type 1 grit group, and they published their results in the June 2018 issue of the journal Pediatrics. Here are some noteworthy results from their study. The average A1C of the studied group was 5.67%. The average daily carbohydrate intake among the group was 36 grams per day. The group demonstrated a very low average total daily dose of insulin of only four-tenths of a unit per kilogram of body weight. The group also had a remarkably low one-to-one -one ratio of triglycerides to high-density lipid cholesterol, a very important marker for heart health. Ms. Belinda Leonards, the lead study author, is quoted in the paper as saying, their blood sugar control seemed almost too good to be true. It's nothing we typically see in the clinic for type 1 diabetes. I've taken the chart that I showed earlier in the talk and I've added in the center there, circled in orange and black, the average result from the type 1 GRIT study. This is a New York Times article written and published the same day those study results were released. Anahad O'Connor wrote the article, and he interviewed my son, Andrew, uh, for the article. Uh, circled in orange at the bottom is a proud dad moment. Andrew's quoted by Anahad as saying, I do this so that I can be healthy. When I eventually move out and go to college, I'm going to keep up what I'm doing because I'm on the right path. Another reason I put this slide up is I circled in the top right there. There's 255 comments on the New York Times website on this article, and among those comments are some of the absolute best testimonials that I've seen from folks following Dr. Bernstein. If you want to read some of those, this is slide 80, and a link to the article is at the bottom of the slide. I'm not going to breeze through some meal details and give some examples of the low-carb foods that my family eats. These are a couple of examples of typical breakfasts. You see here that on one day, Andrew ate one quarter of a taco quiche made in a nine inch round baking dish. 
On the other day, he ate a four egg omelet with bacon, ham, and cheese. You also see things in here like sausage patties, diabetic friendly yogurts, uh, an ounce of chopped pecans, and two tablespoons, a very small amount, of diced blueberries and strawberries. This slide represents typical school day lunches for Andrew. Both of these days he ate sandwiches on a rustic faux wheat bread uh, recipe, which is a low carb recipe I'm gonna share in a later slide. One day was steak and cheese with mayo. The other day was peanut butter and Walden Farm sugar-free jelly. You can see things on here like uh, uh, diabetic friendly yogurts, uh, dill pickle, pumpkin seeds, red grapes, a bag of Quest protein chips, which are pictured to the bottom right there. Um, this slide has typical dinners. On one of these days, you see T-bone steak. The other day, you see pork chops. And you see vegetables such as steamed broccoli, yellow squash, coleslaw, pan-fried okra. And as is typical in my home, a dessert was served on both evening meals. Uh, one of those desserts was a low-carb Boston poke cake. The other one was a low-carb New York-style cheesecake with a two tablespoons of diced blueberries and strawberry and some sugar-free chocolate syrup. And because I had a little extra room on the slide, I tossed in a couple more pictures of desserts just to try to demonstrate that we are not deprived. The photograph to the left is of a lemon blueberry cake, and it is divine. The photograph to the right is of a Kentucky butter cake with pecan halves on top. So if you take those last three slides and total up the meals on the right and left-hand columns, you get to these total daily macronutrients. You can see 30 grams of carbs. On one day, Andrew ate 285 grams of protein and 3,228 calories. On the other day, 231 grams of protein and 2,677 calories. You can see that these days exhibit some variability. Absolute rigidity is not required, but all of these meals were consistent with our low carbohydrate and high protein meal plan. So now I'm gonna share some food related tips and tricks and I'm gonna start by warning about hidden sugars in food, particularly in processed foods. You must review not just nutrition labels, but you gotta read ingredients lists. For example, maltodextrin is in many sugar-free products, including powdered sweeteners. Maltodextrin rapidly digest the glucose and will spike blood sugar. Things like mannitol, sorbitol, sucrose, xylose, lactose, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on that can be found in products that are labeled sugar-free will spike blood sugar. Very much worth buying Dr. Bernstein's book and reading his extensive lists of these ingredients that will spike blood sugar. Natural sweeteners like honey, molasses, corn syrup, etc., 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 will spike blood sugars. In short, you have to read labels and you have to look out for ingredients. And really you need to let your blood sugar results guide your future decisions much more than any nutrition label. Eating at restaurants is not hard. Uh, there are a few exceptions uh, and there's some landmines. Uh, for example, it's common for pancake batter to be added to scrambled eggs and omelets. Picture to the right there is a recent example I had in an IHOP. Uh, if you don't ask for shelled eggs, as I did, and you can see it printed on my receipt there, you will get a pre-made mixture of scrambled eggs combined with some pancake batter, which enhances the fluffiness of scrambled eggs and omelets. And that pancake batter will rapidly spike the blood sugar of a diabetic. It's common for chicken to be sugar brined. It's common for barbecue to have brown sugar added to it. Many salad dressings have added sugar. Bisques and soups are often loaded with rice and wheat flour, and diet sodas are really not trustworthy in a restaurant setting. Personally, I like to stick with meat and vegetables, predominantly at barbecue or steak places, or breakfast foods, or simple salads with meat, and then blue cheese dressing, which is my preference, or ranch dressing, which is Andrew's preference. This slide shows using a McDonald's uh, triple cheeseburger on a smart bun to feed Andrew. The triple, triple cheeseburger is a neat sandwich because it's three all beef patties with two slices of cheese in between those three patties. So it's very easy to dump out of the bun from McDonald's and load it into a smart bun. If you pair that sandwich with a bag of Quest protein chips, which is pictured there to the bottom left, you get 572 calories, 57 grams of protein, 
and 12 grams of carbohydrate. So this is a meal that's very consistent with our low carb, high protein diet. And it came from a fast food restaurant with us adding a smart bun and a bag of protein chips. Prior to joining Type 1 Grit, my family rarely fiddled with low carb breads. Today, my children eat lunchtime sandwiches most days and usually on one of these two low carb bread staples that my wife makes. In the next few slides, I'm going to make a few recipe and cookbook recommendations. This one is from Miss Vicki DeBeer. It's entitled The Low Carb Solution for Diabetics. Uh, Vicki lives in South Africa. Her son is a type 1 diabetic, and they follow uh, Dr. Bernstein's regimen with him. This is Miss Maria Emmerich of Maria Mind Body Health. And Maria has a great website with a lot of recipes available online, plus many cookbooks with great recipes. This is Miss Carolyn Ketchum of All Day I Dream About Food, which is an online food blog, just loaded up with great low-carb recipes. And Carolyn likewise has many, many low-carb recipe books available in all common bookstores and Amazon.com, and my wife uses a lot of her material. So now I'd like to introduce you to the Revere Foundation, which does business primarily as Let Me Be 83. The Foundation's mission is to promote a diabetes management regimen anchored in nutrition and the proper use of insulins that allows people with diabetes to achieve near to normal blood glucose levels. Our goals are to inform patients of the choice and to change standards of care that make success nearly impossible. So I love Warren Buffett. I think he has a lot of great quotes. These are two quotes of Warren Buffett's that really resonate with me about why I'm involved with the Revere Foundation. So the first quote is, if you're in the luckiest 1% of humanity, you owe it to the rest of humanity to think about the other 99%. The other quote says, should you find yourself in a chronically leaky boat, energy devoted to changing vessels is likely to be more productive than energy devoted to patching leaks. Unfortunately, Warren also says, People will always try to stop you from doing the right thing if it is unconventional. And this is conventional. Dietary advice that a teenage type 1 diabetic boy needs a minimum of 225 grams of dietary carbohydrate per day. So I've already shared with you my son's levels of success and the fact that he eats no more than 13% of this recommendation. And for the past nine years, neither Andrew nor me has eaten an ear of corn or a plate of pasta. And don't forget, the Institute of Medicine's dietary reference intake indicates that dietary carbohydrates are not required. So does the conventional high-carb dietary advice make sense? It's what most medical professionals and dietitians still espouse, and I simply don't understand why. In short, the Revere Foundation exists because well-controlled diabetes is the leading cause of nothing, and prevailing outcomes are not well-controlled. There are many resources available at letmebea3.org. There's things like recipes and links to recipes blogs, recommended products such as snack foods, cooking supplies. There's an online store with recommended books, swag like shirts, caps, coffee mugs. Um, there's infographics, many of which you've seen in my slide deck today. Information about Dr. Bernstein and his regiment, pertinent diabetes university videos. There's fundraising information. I'll remind you that it's a 501c3 public charity and we would certainly appreciate your support. And there's information about events that we hold from time to time. The foundation is also working on a documentary film. When we finish the film, it will be a full feature length film, but filming is still in progress. Uh, but we have released a 22 minute short film and uh, I think it's great. I would encourage you to uh, take a few minutes to watch that film. Uh, a link to the film is at the bottom of this slide. If you want to grab the deck later, this is slide 103. In closing, I'd like to share with you what I consider some lost wisdom of the past. The words that I'm about to read to you were written by Dr. Elliot Jocelyn, the founder of the Jocelyn Diabetes Center. 
They were published in an article that Dr. Jawson wrote. It was published June 2nd of 1923 in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Dr. Jocelyn wrote, Successful treatment of diabetes with insulin depends on the utilization of all those measures that have proved the greatest value in the treatment of diabetes without insulin. These are adherence to a diet which will keep the urine sugar-free, avoidance of overnutrition or extreme undernutrition, and a method of life compatible with the strengths such a diet affords. Insulin does not cure diabetes. Insulin does not allow a diabetic to eat anything he desires. It is cruel for prominent individuals to make such statements and arouse false hope. It is true that heretofore there has never been anything discovered as valuable for the diabetic as insulin, but diabetes, though subdued, is not yet conquered. And I'd like to leave you with this thought. It's actually a quote, my favorite quote from Vince Lombardi. Perfection is not attainable. But if we chase perfection, we can catch excellence. I really hope in the past hour that I've demonstrated to you that there's a lot of excellence catching that is happening in the type 1 diabetes community, even among children, adolescents, and teenagers. But it's heartbreaking to me that it's so rare. I desperately want to see a larger percentage of our community achieving these types of success. I hope that my talk was helpful to you. And thank you for listening.